first thing, announcement. So on Friday at 1.15 in BYAC, uh, the brickyard, the C, the building that's uh, in the courtyard there, room 110. We're gonna be hosting a um, cybersecurity information session. So if you've been, uh, uh, got bit by the bug because you like um, doing this crypto stuff and you like uh, all the security stuff that we're talking about, we're gonna be talking about the, um, a couple things. One, the cybersecurity programs we have here at ASU, which I believe I talked about at the beginning of the semester, but now it's more relevant because you actually know things. Um, so about, specifically we'll talk about the concentration program. We'll also be going over the details of the scholarship for service program. So this is basically fully funded uh, one year of school, I mean, at least one year. So every year of the scholarship, you go work for the federal government. Um, it's fully funded in that it pays for tuition, books, and also a stipend. So you can focus 100% on school. Uh, so I'll be there. There's also, of course, the best uh, thing. There's free food. So there'll be food and drinks. Um, there. So come by, say hi, I'll be there. If you want to talk more? Any questions on this? I'll also post an announcement on Piazza. All right. All right. Logistically, let's see, going forward, um, I'm sad to announce there won't be any more homework assignments before the midterm. So oh, I know. Oh, man. Uh, so, the, so midterm is next week on Thursday. Um, the idea is I don't want to be doing homework assignments before the midterm, so you can focus just on the midterm. <laughs> and then uh, I also won't, it's like two nights. I don't know, the scheduling didn't work. But uh, you also won't have a homework assignment over uh, spring break, so you can actually spend spring break doing stuff. And then we'll have a new assignment when you get back. So be ready to roll. All right, any questions? Midterm exam, let's get away all the questions now. We'll be in this room the exactly the amount of time. Uh, no notes, no smart anythings, no nothing. It'll be on everything we've covered up until Thursday, yes. There'll be a variety of questions that will test your knowledge of the material. Yeah. Would, would we have to correct the cipher, possibly? Or? Maybe. It would, it would you should know how you've done it, right? Yeah. Are we going to study that? Uh, there will be a practice in, uh, midterm exam that will be released soon, and the undergrad TAs will help go over that. So we won't go over that in class, but there will be a practice. Yeah. But it's not a study guide. The guide is study everything in class. <coughs> cool. All right. We're rock and roll. All right. So someone remind us, what are the types, different types of authentication mechanisms that we talked about on Thursday? Signatures. Broadcasters. Signatures. Um, maybe. So signatures we talked about with crypto. This is a little bit different, but related. Yeah. Like biometrics. So biometrics is testing what you are. So the broad category is something that you are. Yeah. What you know, like a password. You have so like the UV keys that we keep talking about, or a, uh, a pop up on your device. Yes, yeah, so these are kind of the three main, and there's, there's other categories that we talked about, but basically, um, what you know, what you have, or what you possess, and what you are are kind of three ways of categorizing this. And again, we've talked about other types of ways, like where you are, right? Context, your location, those can add additional authentication mechanisms, and so. Okay, so I want to remind us, what is the goal of authentication? Yeah, make sure that like someone not only like is able to have access, but they should have access. Yeah, so it's not just what access should you have, but who are you, right? So it's trying to answer a question of identity of, to this system, who are you in this system, right? Are you some random user? Are you a guest who doesn't have a user account? Or are you the administrator of this system? And we know based on access control and, author and authorization that we looked at, all those types of things mean what you can do to the system. But to even start with that, you need to understand, well, who is this person? OK. OK, so we can think, and just like we talked about with crypto systems, right? we can kind of formalize and think about an authentication system in a similar way. And this gives us the ability to kind of 
reason about and think about different crypto systems, or sorry, here, authentication systems, even though they're wildly different, right? So passwords versus fingerprints, right? Those are testing not only different things, but they also have a very different kind of ways of thinking about them. But we can kind of think about them in, these, in this kind of standard way. So we can think about a set A, so some kind of authentication information that proves identity. And then some, we'll talk, and we'll go over through examples, so this will make sense more. Um, we have a, so A is kind of, you can think of your authentication information. So this could be your password that you know. C would be, is complementary information. So what kind of information is stored on the system and is used to validate your authentication information, right? And we can think of, and we'll talk about many different types of schemes of doing something that seems as simple as passwords. Right? And different types of authentication mechanisms have different um, properties. So for instance, maybe the simplest one would be what? What would be the very simplest thing for a password system? You store the password in plain text. Yeah. So complementary information. So in the case of this model, C is the same as A. Right? So you just store exactly their password. And then is it easy to check if they've given you the right password? Yes, it's very easy. String comparison, right? This is something you've been doing in your homework assignments in this class as well as others. And then we need some function. So we need some function to be able to map A to C so that we can check, so we can do the check, right? In our case, where A is equal to C, the complementary function is just the ID function. It just returns whatever it's given. So there's nothing complicated here. We can see that this can be made complicated. And then we have some function L that's going to actually do the verification. You can think of L as login. So it's a function that takes in a piece of authentication information, takes in the complementary information, and returns either true or false. And then we need some way to update things. Because we just had the system. We have no way to say, like, well, I need to change my password, or I need to um, create or enroll a new user. All right, everybody roughly. So if so, we just talked about this in terms of passwords. What about in terms of like biometrics? What would be the equivalence there? What would an A be in this sense? So let's go with a fingerprint. What is it? Yeah, A would be your fingerprint, but what's C? Can the system actually store your fingerprint? No, because it's attached to your finger. is a picture of your fingerprint, then what would your F function be? Something that maps the authentication information in your actual fingerprint to the complementary information that's stored. Yeah. The scanner. Yeah, the scanner that takes a picture of your fingerprint, right? And then you need some Function L, so do you want to do an exact match? Say if this fingerprint matches this picture, because you've only sort of pictures now, right? We're talking about the set C. So I sort of a picture of your fingerprint a year ago, and I have a brand new picture here, but I just say it matches, the pixels match 100%, means that you're good to go.
rather than storing maybe an image, we kind of try to extract features from an image of the fingerprint, and then this would allow us to test that it's the same fingerprint over and over. Maybe we can extract attributes of a, I, I don't know, I studied fingerprints a long time ago, but you know, swirls and circles and all kinds of different types of fingerprints, so you can figure out what general class it is, and then pick uh, different attributes in there that you're going to compare against, and then maybe you can be um, kind of impervious to some kind of noise, right? Because the key problem is here, we can't store the actual fingerprint Right, we can only store attributes of the fingerprint. Yeah. Um, so that idea of like storing out the attributes, where would it go from there? Right. So good. Okay. So in this case, A would be the fingerprint itself, right? C would be the attributes that you store. Okay. And then what would F be? The scanner. Yes, or whatever algorithm you've come up with to create the features, extract the features from the fingerprint from the scanner. Right, so f would be a function you can run on anybody's fingerprint. It will output you some features. And then you need some way l because, again, maybe your finger's sweaty. Or maybe there's stuff on your fingerprint and you've got cut. So you need some kind of noise in there um, to try to do that and do that comparison. And then s would be um, the ability to maybe enroll multiple fingers right, into the system. or. Um, well, you can't really change your fingerprint, but you can change the fingerprint, I guess, that's associated with your account. Yeah? So I'm confused still. The difference between C and F is like F something that implements C then? Or? Uh, the way to think about it, A and C are just data, mm -hmm. right? So A is your actual fingerprint, C is the data points. The question is how do you transform your fingerprint to the data points? And that's with F. And then L is the function that actually checks, okay, give me an A and a C. I will try to say whether it's actually, um, whether you, it's successful logging. More questions on this? All right, let's see if this drives with what we did. Okay, so we have uh, password stored in plain text. Yeah, okay, cool. So A would be a set of strings used for passwords. C is the same as A, they're the same um, any string, and we just have the F is just a identification function, L is just going to be the equality operator, and we can use S to set or change passwords. Okay, so what's one maybe problem with a password authentication system? Super simple. Look at this. This is a essentially easy model. You don't need any framework around here. You don't need to do anything interesting. You just take whatever they give you. Equality comparison. SSL encryption from 
constant time equality operator. Right, I can do that. Uh, <laughs> you have to do more advanced stuff, but yes, and this is how you can break some systems. Maybe we'll talk about it later. Um, yeah, but still, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Uh, people tend to reuse passwords. If grade scope gets compromised, then you're able to get all your everyone's passwords, and it's a good chance some of those match with other people's accounts that may have more sensitive data. Okay, so grade scope, let's see. Okay, so grade scope can get hacked, and if they do, then somebody can see all of the passwords. So let's say, talk about their database, right? So grade scope, we can assume, is storing everything in a database somewhere, right? Using any passwords in some table. And if they're able to break it, if uh, somebody's able to break into either their systems or just the database itself and extract all the username and passwords, Right, now not only can they impersonate everyone on Gradescope and log in as them, they can also, uh, how many people use the same password uh, for Gradescope as another site? No one it's okay to admit it. <laughs> By the end of the class, maybe even this class, hopefully we'll change that. Um, okay, what about any two sites? Do you reuse any passwords on any sites? So, so if somebody, let's say, got access to Gradescope, what if you use the same password on uh, Gradescope as your bank? Then what happens? Your bank can log into your Gradescope. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. Anyway. <laughs> go in and make a submission for you. Uh, uh, yeah, or what, or what if an attacker steals your username and password credentials? So you're an attacker, put yourself in the mind of an attacker. You've just broken into Gradescope's database. You've stolen all the username and passwords. What do you do with that? Choose first. Every possible site is a lot. There's like a, a billion plus of them. Um, what happens to me is like I got hacked like that one time, and the hacker like tried to lock in every possible pin on my game account. Mm -hmm. And like I can, my game account was in Netflix and Amazon and like Facebook at every possible site. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So you could use uh, depending on the value <laughs> of what you think um, the account is worth. Um, yeah. Game account. What game account? Yeah, so there's, uh, we've done some research on underground forums, and there's actually a whole market for like League of Legends accounts that are at certain levels, or, uh, uh, various types of accounts, things that you wouldn't think actually have value, but people will pay money to get an account uh, that has those things. Yeah. So jumping back to grade scope, like, would, do they use single sign-on, and what's the benefit to a single sign-on model that just a direct username and password? I don't remember if they do or not, but let's, Thinking through an attacker, okay, so, so the first thing I would try is email services, right? So I would try um, Gmail, I would just try all the usernames and password combinations, and the usernames, I believe on Gradescope, are your email, so I could see exactly which people have Gmail accounts. I would try logging in with all of those, because as soon as I broke into their Gmail, then I would set up a filter to forward all of their, or a rule to forward all of their incoming mail to another mail account. And then I just do password resets on all of their other accounts uh, to then get access. So I can read their email, figure out what accounts they have access to, what things are high value, and then from there, um, just reset the password. So you only need to compromise their email, really, to uh, do anything from there. Um, cool. Or the other way, if that doesn't work, then maybe, yeah, other high value targets. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so this is all the result of, um, let's say, great scope, maybe storing passwords in plain text, and a hacker breaks in and steals the username password. But are, is the only thing we're worried about a malicious external hacker? What are some other threats that great?
trade scope would need to consider. Yeah. Um, a malicious employee? A malicious employee? Yeah, a great scope intern that's there for three months and just copies the database to a flash drive and then sells it to somebody, somebody later. What else? Yeah, the server that they're using may be vulnerable or maybe is misconfigured and it's allowing connections from anywhere. Maybe they are really good about doing backups and they're using uh, Amazon's S3 to do backups, but they forgot to mark their backups as not world readable. And so anybody can find that and then download the whole database. These things happen. Um, maybe, like, actually this happened to Twitter. Maybe, so, I, I know I've seen this. So some of you I know use like print out, <laughs> printing out things as, as you're debugging, right, your programs to see if they're working or not. Uh, the, I guess, more professional term for this would be logging, right? So as your application runs, you have logging statements that log somewhere everything that's going on. Um, it's very easy to accidentally log a password somewhere. And now you have maybe not your database, because your database is secure and everything, but maybe the flight text password is stored in some log somewhere and an employee could get to it. So actually Twitter found this out, that they were accidentally someplace logging a password to a plain text file that was just part of their logging system. So anybody that had, that had access to the logs could read people's passwords. Um, so it's a bug and a mistake that could happen completely not maliciously, right? This is just a unintentional thing that could happen. Um, OK. So we talked about that, talked about that, good. OK. What about a? Okay, so lots of problems. Are there any benefits? Yeah. Really easy to implement. Yeah, super easy to implement. What else? Yeah. It would be fairly fast. Fast? Yeah. That's definitely true. What else? Mm. Yeah. If a user forgets their password, you can give it back to them. Yeah, if a user forgets, anybody forget a password? Mm. Yeah. It's actually, as a user, it's much nicer to be given your password, right? Although, on the downside then, now there's a like trail in your email of your password. So if somebody has access to your email, now they have access to your password. But uh, from a user experience perspective, it actually makes it much better than other techniques where uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, where they send you a link in your email that expires. And so you have to click the link to go to a page that then you create a new <laughs> password. Um, all that's way more difficult than just saying, yep, here's your password. So uh, it's important, we'll talk about the dangers and we've talked about a little bit of storing plain text passwords, but if you just think of something as like purely evil and bad and people are stupid if they use it, uh, that's not always considering kind of the whole, whole scenario and the whole case today. All right. So let's also think about Where do I want to go? Oh no. Oh. Cool. Okay. And I still can't see my cursor. I don't know why this happened. Okay. Uh, okay, so now we have a shared system. So how does, so we've talked about um, authorization on the Unix system, right? We talked about the rewrite execute bits for owner, group, and others. Um, but how does actually logging in work? And is your password, so eventually you will get access, we'll give everyone access to a shared server for one of the homework assignments. Um, so you'll all 370 of you have an account on this system that you'll SSH into. How is, Authentication done there. Or how do we even know what user accounts are what? Yeah. Originally, you just have plain text passwords and slash SC slash password. Yeah, let's check that out. Yeah, so there's a file etc password. Uh, can you read this in the back? Is it big enough? Yeah, okay. Cool. So we have a file there. We can see it's readable, right? It's owned by group. Uh, the group is root. 
and or it's owned by Root Group Root, and it's readable and writable by Root, and readable from everyone. Uh, so let's look up this. Check it. Yep, same thing. Okay. So we can see there's a bunch of users here. And the way this used to work was actually not plain text uh, because, well, you can't have a file that's readable by everyone on the system that is also a plain text uh, password. So, okay, this file does many things. One thing is mapping. Man, I'm going to go crazy. Okay. Where's number two? Okay, so it's mapping, so this is it. The data format here is separated by colons. The first column is the username, so username Ubuntu, which I just logged in as. The second column, and X we'll get to in a second. The third column is the user ID and group ID of that user. So this, and remember we talked about computers don't like to think about people or identities in terms of uh, a string name. They wanna think about it in terms of numbers, so to the system. Uh, the Ubuntu user is user ID uh, 1000, and then when it needs to print it out, like for instance, there's a nice command, you can run ID that tells you who you are, and it maps your integer 1000 to Ubuntu. It says, okay, your, your username is Ubuntu, uh, and your user ID is 1000. How does this command know that user ID 1000 is the name Ubuntu? It has to use this file, it's not magic. So root is also user ID zero. Um, so not magic at all, this, this is what this file is used for, so everyone needs access to this file, right? So I'm gonna ask a simple question, why don't you wanna put plain text passwords in this file? Everyone has access. Everyone has access, right? It's insane, you would not want that. Everyone has access to this file. And so, what, so, okay, if we think about what do we want from the system, right? We want to be able to prove that the user knows the password, but we don't want to actually store that password in plain text. Maybe what can we use or what can we think of that could help us rather than storing the plain text password? What do we know that's really difficult, easy to calculate forward, but difficult to go back from? Cryptographic hash, right? A cryptographic hash, if I hash uh, a password, right, I can store it in this file, and then presumably the attacker, as we talked about, would have to brute force that entire search space looking for that password, right? One of the key properties we wanted from cryptographic hash functions are that it's difficult to, um, to find a collision, right? Where, or it's difficult to go back. So if you have the hash of something, it's difficult to find that input that generated that. And so this is essentially how <coughs> passwords are done here. So let's think about this. So um, oh, there we go. Okay, figured out how to make it go back. Okay, so let's think. So we have this file. And we'll do the hash of, what do you want the root password to be? Oh, you don't get a choice. Uh, this is kind of a common one. Um, and I have a bunch of users here. Let's think it's all of you. I'm just gonna, you know, I do, I've memorized all your names, but I'll just call you student one, student two, <laughs> student three. All right, so student ones is the hash of ooh, password. And student two's password, what I'm storing is the hash of Foo bar. Ooh, we step up our game. <laughs> These are just, you don't know how it's ordered. The hash. Uh, let's see. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have all of these 
for 370 users, right? So we've done the hash, we can pick whatever our favorite hash function is, SHA-256, whatever, right? So then how does that map into our model here of authentication systems? So what's A in this case? Yeah. The password. The password. And then what's C? The hash of the password. And then what's F? The hashing function. The hash function. And then what's L? Yeah. Does the hash of what's entered match the stored hash? Yep. Does the hash of what's entered match the stored hash? Right. Perfect. So actually, pretty easy. It's pretty similar, right? The only thing we're adding is hash functions in there. But compared to the password one, it's pretty good. Um, So what are some benefits of this over plain text passwords? Um, like you said, that it goes in like the blender type thing, right? It's hard to get it back. Yeah, it should be difficult to go backwards if you get the hashes. Right? And we can, one of the benefits, clear benefits, is we can hopefully have a file that everyone can read, right? Essentially all of these hashes are known. And we would hope that nobody can just steal the plain text passwords like they could when they were stored in plain text. What are some downsides? <laughs> oh, uh, I can no, no, back one, sorry. Or two. Yeah. Uh, two different files. If, uh, if two passwords are the same, the hash would be the same. Yeah, so if two passwords are the same, the hash would be the same. So out of 370 students, how many do you think are going to choose the password password? Hopefully none. <laughs> Before taking this class. <laughs> so 37. 37? Okay. 10%? Uh, yeah, it, it will be a number greater than one. I can definitely guarantee that. It's definitely, and if it's not password, it's going to be password one or password one, two, three, or something. Right. So there'll be some fraction, let's call it even even one percent, right? Or even let's say you as a user. Right? So you as a user, um, you change your password to password. I mean you don't need to do this, but it's pretty easy. So you can do the hash of password, right? You can see the password in there. And you can just see who else has this hash, right? And now you've broken the passwords of student one and student 10 and all the other students in here that have this exact same password. So why is that? Necessarily, right? What would be another way to guess and identify who has what password here? Yeah. If we know the hash, we can just try a bunch on our own machine. Yeah, if we know the hash, and we have to assume people know the hash function, right? Because the system, like again, we're not going to do security through obscurity, just like a crypto system. We have to assume the adversary knows exactly how our systems work, right? So we can download this list. We can try, uh, let's even just dictionary words and see who has a word from the dictionary. We hash that word, look it up against everybody else in the class. And as soon as we found a hit and we match, we know we found it, we've broken their password. And then we just keep going and we'll probably get about, I don't know, 10 to 15% of passwords that way. So even though we have a case where it seems like, well, We've actually made a lot of progress. And even though this is the very frustrating thing, even though we've chosen this cryptographically secure hash function, why can we break it?
looking through a dictionary. Yeah. People are forgetful. Yeah, people, so people are not choosing random passwords, right? People are, it's not like a message, but a message may be very long and I have no idea what the contents are, right? The password is gonna be maybe 12 characters max and it's going to be likely, uh, so if you think about the space of all possible 12 digit characters, that is very large. But if you think about what the space of what password people actually choose, it's much more limited. So I can search in that space to break people's passwords and guess what they are, which is much faster than trying to brute force, let's say the, sh uh, the SHA hash, right? And trying to brute force uh, 256 digits, or bits, sorry. Um, yeah, so definitely the problem is, I mean, part of the problem is users, let's say. Um, okay. you have, if I can put password in and then get stuff out, a constant thing out, then I can just check everything looking for that. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so you said like they'll expect that the password be like 12 characters long and people are going to use words, but that's where like using like something that generates your passwords for you, right, like comes in hand. Yep. Yeah, we'll talk about that uh, more. We're building up to that. Okay. There's something else over here? Yeah. <laughs> Hash for the password and the username so they don't have the same hashes. Ah, okay, so yeah, one of the so the key problem here, right, is we have two different users who both use the same username, or sorry, both use the same password, and the hash is only based on their username, um, and or sorry, based on their password. Um, they don't actually do that, and I there's probably a good reason why. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head. Uh, the idea is let's generate some random information to add to the password so that everyone else has a different, uh, so the idea is, and this is what we're getting into it here, we'll get into it more in depth in a second, but uh, the idea, and this is actually already a concept that was essentially done by Unix to deal with this problem in the EPC password file. Um, so uh, the idea is called the, so you have hash and you're gonna add assault so the idea is student one in this case would store the hash of, so every user is gonna have a different salt. Let's call this one alpha. Uh, so the hash of password, and here I'm using plus to mean concatenation, concatenated with alpha. And the interesting thing is so to be able to recompute this, I have to store alpha, right? So I'm gonna generate some bit of information for everyone else. So user two, I forgot what their name was, Um Yeah, We'll have a different hash and beta. So now if user S370, has a hash of password plus uh, oh, I'm running out of Greek letters. <laughs> Omega. Absolutely. Omega? I can't call this song. <laughs> B. B. B? Okay. <laughs> whatever. Uh, whatever. Some new salt. Right? The, the key thing is even though the passwords are the same, because they have different salts, the hashes will be completely different. So before the attacker just generated the hash of password, compared it to everything, and matched immediately 5%, let's say, right? How do they do that in this scenario here? Yeah. They'd have to try password with all of the salt attached to it. Yeah, so then now you're making the job of the attacker more difficult, right? So rather than doing one computation and being able to break everyone in the database, they have to at least perform the hash on everybody's unique salt. And this, uh, we'll get into it more in depth, but um, 
This is kind of, for now, the central idea. And this is actually what was used in Unix systems. So uh, the way it acts, and this, this was so that passwords could actually be sto stored in this EDC password file. Uh, this is where all coming back to this, this whole idea of being able to do this. And so you can uh, represent this with the Unix standard hash function. Uh, basically, and interestingly, having to be eight characters or less could actually not be more than eight characters. And then interesting had a two character hash ID. So it used two characters as the, the salt essentially and an 11 character hash. And instead of like appending it to it, because this was made, uh, I don't know necessarily say before cryptographic hashes, but slightly different was um, they had the two character hash ID would use different variations of DES. Um, so you have slightly modified different DESs, similar, exact same idea of using this, but rather the salt being added to the password before being hashed. Here you have uh, 4,096 different hash functions in some sense to use. And all the, lo the login functions are like login or SU, anything that checks your password. And um, anything that changes your password would be in the S function. But eventually, and this is why we can see the X's here, eventually they realize even storing passwords here is an insane idea. It doesn't it doesn't add uh, anything really. No, not everybody should be able to read even the hash of your password. Um, so that is why. Yeah, they made an etc shadow file. So it's owned by root, uh, readable by root, and nobody else can read it. So if I tried to cat this file, uh, it would tell me permission denied. I can't read it. There are hashes stored in here. I'm not going to show you it now. I'll, I will show you it later, hopefully. Maybe. Uh, anyways, so, uh, but this is what the what the X means here for the password means the password's not here, it's in the ETC shadow file. So then you can get around this problem and say, hey, it's a bad idea that everyone's hashes are public, right? Even with salts. Um, but it does give a lot of good things. Cool. So if we think like how this kind of process works, uh, essentially we can think that uh, Alice, as our principal, talks to the service provider, like a Unix system, and says, okay, I would like an account. I am Alice, my password is password. And then it would use S, F to generate an encrypted password, which would look something like this. So the first two digits there would specify the hash ID. Um, and this is the line in the EDC password file that we looked at. Uh, user ID, group ID, the name of the user, and the last one is the shell use. Um, and so this password is A, and it's kind of a graphical representation of like the password that is given by Alice is A, and what's stored in the EDC password file or EDC shadow is the complementary information. And this basically does, the login function is pretty easy. It does a check of call F on the password and check if it's equal to what's in there. Cool, okay. So, Okay, it's kind of an overview, thing about it formally, and now we'll start digging in more and more into the details. So, um, what are our goals as attackers when we want to attack an authentication system? Yeah. Gain the ability to use other users' credentials. Yeah, so we want to, um, so, okay, one way to think about that would be, okay, yeah, we want to find um, other people's credentials. So how would that look, let's say, in our model? What are we trying to find? A. Yeah, we want to find a little a, right, in a, such that for some f, uh, that f of a equals c, and c is associated with the entity we want, right? I'm just kind of stating that a little bit more formally, right? So. We're missing L, right? So we still need L, the login function. So um, okay, cool. So what are okay? So how can we do this then? In fact, we've already talked about some ways.
So if we uh, find C, then we want to find something that when we run through our function f would give us C. Right? So this would be, we may have different uh, models or ways to do that. But what if we don't have access to the hashes? on the actual login, right? So try every password that we can and give it to the system. And we'll say, hey, I'm Alice. My password is uh, foo. And it will say false. Uh, hey, I'm Alice. My password is password. And it will say true. And we're like, great. Now we know Alice's password. Right? What's the key difference between these two scenarios? different scenarios, right, how can we try to prevent an attacker from breaking our authentication system? Yeah. Multiple uh, tries will log you out or won't allow you to enter anymore. Okay, yeah, so just like a cell phone, right, we can have multiple tries will actually log you out or it will delay you. And what is that actually doing to the attacker? Delaying them? Delaying them, right? Limiting their ability to guess over and over, right? And which of these two scenarios will that affect the attacker? Uh, both of them, I guess, are direct approaches. Uh, having C or not having C. Yeah, so this is the important thing. This is why um, you ever log into like your own computer and maybe mistype your password. If you notice, it usually like takes a little bit, um, a little bit of a delay from when you, if you get it correct, it usually logs you in immediately. If you get it incorrect, there's a tiny delay that maybe grows larger over time. And that's to prevent somebody from sitting at your computer and just typing in and guessing passwords because it's gonna slow them down over time, right? But if somebody stole the hash of your password, there's nothing, L can't do anything to stop them, right? Because the login function is not involved there, right? It's bypassing that completely. This is why the distinction here is super important, especially when thinking about preventing different types of things, right? It's probably good to have maybe both, but um, we have to be thinking about what situation. So if we think, okay, well, one way we can prevent this, well, maybe a general class of prevention would be slowing people down. And maybe we can do that through L of locking the phone after three tries or locking the device for 10 minutes so that literally an attacker could guess maybe uh, 10, you know, three guesses per 10 minutes or something. Um, you actually, though, can get around that. So um, I actually. 
actually haven't played with it, but there's a box I have in my office that uh, I think it was for iPhone 7s, but basically you would connect the box uh, through whatever the port was, and it would start guessing passcodes, and when it guessed it wrong, it would shut off the phone before it was able to save how many tries you had, and then it would turn the phone back on, and then keep guessing, and you could brute force a like four digit pin in about a day and a half. That's uh, very based on this device. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So yeah, it's, it's really like bu essentially bypassing this login functionality, and so I think newer iPhones are much more secure in that sense, but uh, still like flaws in the implementation could allow an attacker around these anti-brute forcing mechanisms. Or for instance, let's think of a website, right? So we'll use Gradescope again right now. Um, so if you wanted to guess, let's say, my password on Gradescope, you, know, you could try, you know my email, you could go try my email and my password, okay? or you could try password, and then password one, and password two. Uh, Gradescope would probably, let's say Gradescope is limiting your login, so after three login attempts from the same IP address, they say, sorry, uh, you're locked out, so does that mean I'm safe? Why not? I could use a different ID. In fact, I could use, I could rent a botnet that has thousands and thousands of IDs, and I could just round robin all my requests through there and continue doing that such that, um, uh, such that I never rise above the threshold that they think from any one IP address. I could even do, um, that also helps a lot when you're dealing with a, let's say like a banking site that locks your account after three tries and you have to call to get it unlocked. Well, rather than breaking one account, I'll just try password on every single email address I know of on that banking site, right? And each of them is one try. And then I try maybe the second most common password on all the banking sites, on all the users. Right, so I'm doing it across users because I don't care whose account I break into, I'm just trying to break into account. Um, okay, cool. So we talked about we can maybe slow down L in order to try to limit the ability of the attacker if they don't have C. What else can we do to prevent? So we can, well, and yeah, okay, so we could maybe think about this F function, right? We know the login function has to use F to do the comparison, right? And we know that an attacker, if they get the complementary information in, in the terms we're thinking about a hash, right, then if we make that slow for them, it will be very difficult to brute force. How slow do we want to make it? What if we made it like five seconds? Is that slow enough to slow down an attacker? And one way we can make it slow, we talked about multiple hash functions. Why don't you run the same hash function a million times? Right? Just input into SHA-256, output SHA-256, and then put that back in, new hash, you do that a million times, get an output that will be deterministic. Maybe it takes five seconds on some machine. Is that secure? Or would that slow down brute forcing? like Unix or Linux, like we saw, the EPC shadow file, by moving the passwords there, normal user accounts should not be able to read the hashes. But is 
that true? Yeah. Does that mean that kind of this security, you have to require there's some user that's trustworthy since we have this information, like the super user? Yeah, so in this case, the super, like somebody, like the system, you can think of it as the system, right? The system needs to have access to this information, right? In the, the Unix model, it's the root user has access to this information. And this means if somebody exploits a bug in our operating system in order to elevate themselves from a normal user to root, now they have access to all the passwords. So it still doesn't, it can make things definitely more difficult and it's strictly better than just keeping passwords in the EC uh, password file where everyone can read it. And it's, you didn't get it yet, it's very ironic that there are no passwords in the EC password file. Um, but you still have this problem of if any of your systems are compromised. So it, it doesn't necessarily prevent, but it can make the attacker's job more difficult. Um, and the other thing is, well, why don't we hide L, the login function? Right? If attackers can just guess username and password, why don't we hide them? Yeah. Yeah, how does the user get there, right? It's something you, you really can't, it, you can't, um, you can try, right? Has anybody done this? Maybe their work or something it has login restricted only from certain IP addresses? Yeah, some people. We work with some partners on some of our research and it's insanely annoying. <laughs> Essentially what happens is there's like one person who can access this system and everyone else asks them for information or we have to set up a VPN from us into their thing. It's, anyways, it can be a nightmare, but you can try to do things like prevent or you can maybe detect when, try to detect when things do that. Um, okay, cool. So <coughs> in terms of websites or in terms of what's the most, let's say dominant authentication system? Yeah, username and password, right? Does anybody, do you actually use anything that's different? So do you use solely biometrics? There's systems you have access to only if you provide a fingerprint? Like some phones have that now, where you can you can like almost do it just face your fingerprint on Sure, so phones have that, but uh, you can also think that when you turn it off and turn it back on, it won't allow you to use your face, right? You have to input your pin code, your passcode or whatever. So there's still a password-based mechanism there. Not, I'd say super popular, but yeah, definitely that's uh, one that uh, basically uses public key crypto to identify you. So you're identified by possessing the private key. What else? Yeah. Uh, pattern matching. Pattern matching? In what sense? So the. Like, like the ah, the phone unlock with the pattern. Yeah, so that's. Uh, still a type of password, right? Because it's something that you kind of know. And uh, the other thing is there's been a lot of studies where users are very bad at uh, doing random looking things. So it can be actually pretty easy-ish to brute force. Um, but yeah, it definitely, there's also other things. Um, or there used to be things in Windows where you could choose a picture and you would have to like, you could set up a authentication mechanism of like, boop these people on the nose and then draw a line from here to here. Um, and it turns out those also are very easy to break because people are very bad at generating random looking things like that. Um, maybe your, what about your, anybody have access to any buildings or anything with their ASU ID? Yeah. yeah, right? So this is actually not a password, it's something that you have, it's just like a key, right? So in the physical world, it's kind of funny that keys actually are something that you possess to authenticate yourself to a house, but the digital space is all passwords and things in your mind and everything. Cool. Okay. So I think we agree most common. Um, what, how, so you've, I don't know, grown up using username and password systems for a long time. Do you have any thoughts or feelings on them? Excellent. Five stars would recommend. <laughs> or what? Why are they annoying? Yeah, because if you forget, it's a huge pain to try to reset your password. There <laughs> used to be some sites where I literally would never remember my password, and so basically, like, you go to the site, you just immediately click for your password, and you get a link, and then you're logged in, and then it's good. What else? Yeah. 
so many subscriptions and services that make you use a p username and password, and you have to like either use we use the same password to not forget, or just have different passwords for everything. Yeah. So you. Yeah. Exactly. So even and maybe you're even aware of it before this class that you shouldn't reuse passwords, but you have hundreds of accounts online. How do you possibly create a random, unique password for every one of those? Um, yeah, it gets to be crazy. Requirements on passwords have changed over time, right? So maybe they check for things like password and then require you to have a number and a symbol so people will do password one exclamation point. Um, yeah. Um, some things like ASU require you to change your password every so often. Yeah, like my ASU requires you to change your password every so often. Um, we'll talk about that later, but yeah, that's uh, frustrating. Like I know, I don't know about you, but I just had like a pattern that I would rotate through. I mean, not for my ASU, but actually, I think it was a company I worked at, uh, at Microsoft. I, don't know. I always had the same like password, and then just like change certain things about it that was easy to type in every single time. But then sometimes I forget which one, and so you have to like cycle through each of them, make sure you try all of them before you can actually log in. Um, any other thoughts? Password history and what's that? So that um, you can't reuse the same way you just did. Yeah, so that's part of uh, refreshing is they keep track so you don't reuse one. Yeah. Is like a muscle memory associated with it? Like you just set it for the field and type it over and over again? Like you can use the same password for everything? Yeah, and that's incredibly you know, useful or annoying when you're on different sites, right? Is, uh, does anybody have a, a strategy for? Creating and using passwords. <laughs> Would you like to share it with the class? <laughs> yeah. uh, so one of the jobs I worked, the password was uh, you go up uh, D A Q exclamation point, then you go down the second row, and then you put. So I worked on a submarine, so it was the whole number of the submarine in between or afterwards, and we just cycle like which row we would use. And this password was used on a secret system. So it's like, <laughs> I don't know, it's not very really secure, but. Um, yeah, so it's like a trade off between usability. You have a complex looking password if you just looked at it, but if you actually understood the patterns of the keyboard and everything. Yeah. Actually, so this makes a lot of sense. I had a student who was uh, in the military, and he had a crazy password for our system that was like, go up this way and then down this way and then over. And it's like, my keyboard is like the ergonomic one, and so nothing lines up. It's a huge pain to log into the system. So, okay, so yeah, maybe have a scheme where you're. Uh, rotating through those things. Yeah. Uh, another common way is uh, develop a phrase that mm. then you can only do certain words and then replace certain words with maybe like a character or symbol, but it will be still easy to remember if you give like a, like a 10 word phrase. Yeah, so maybe rather than thinking of it in terms of password, you can think of it in terms of past phrases and think about phrases. What about how do you deal with the massive number of username and passwords that you need? Password manager. Password manager, what else? A <laughs> hundred things sticky you notes know, on the keyboard that has all of your passwords on your site. I don't anymore, but I used to have an entire document literally all my passwords. Yeah, so a document on your computer with all of your passwords. I guess it's the digital equivalent of a uh, sticky note. What else? Anybody else? Yeah. Probably keep it um, related to your impressions on the site. Okay, in what sense? So.
remember a one-off thing for that stupid site. Um, my mom actually came up with her own algorithm where she would use parts of the domain name to like have a base password and then use parts of the domain name in the new password. It's like, how did you come up with this? <laughs> <laughs> I actually use the same yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nice. Okay, so phrases, uh, maybe from homework assignments, maybe breaking crypto things. Um, yeah, so I think, I, I don't know, kind of uh, paraphrasing Churchill, he was talking about democracy, but passwords are the worst form of authentication except for all the other forms that have been tried from time to time. So I think it's kind of sums up my feelings about passwords. It's like, it, they have all of these problems that we've talked about, but it's insanely frustrating. But they're still used so, so often because they actually do they, for all of their flaws, especially with computer systems, it is the best form we have right now, right? Um, you know, yes, it sucks to get you know, locked out of a site because you don't remember your password, uh, but it also sucks to get locked out of your house when you lose your keys. Um, so yeah, there's kind of a lot of problems and some of these uh, inherent vulnerabilities, some of the things we've talked about, they're incredibly easy to guess. Like human beings, when we access a column with something random, it is very difficult to come up with something that's actually random looking, right? And then, and then, but it's not actually just humans' faults, right? It's like now, as part of the nature of a password system, you have to memorize that super random thing. So how you're gonna come up with something completely random that nobody else can guess, but that is somehow meaningful to you where you will remember it the next time you use this site. And by the way, you need to use a different password on all 100 sites that you use, yeah. Do you recommend using password? Yes, I do. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. And I'll kind of explain why. Other things, they're easy to snoop. Like not just, uh, so we can think of as passwords are transmitted over the wire, so we're not using encryption or SSL. Somebody can steal passwords. Uh, there's a great thing at the, uh, at the DEF CON security conference. They have a wall of sheep, is what they call it. And so they sniff all of the Wi-Fi traffic. And some things like, um, like mail, like pop checking or FTP or something will actually send passwords in clear text. And so they sniff for all these things on the wireless network and when they see it, your, like the username and password that they see shows up on this wall over time. And yeah, so it can be very easy to accidentally snoop. And then you have snooping in person, right? You know, you're watching somebody type in their password. It's not difficult to kind of see what they're typing in. Um, yeah. My, uh, so I live in an apartment complex and the resident portal mm -hmm. uh, sends the password over a HTTP get request in a URL encoded string. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, stopped it and I was like, oh, th there's my password. <laughs> yeah, these are the type of things people look for. Yeah. Easily sniff and detect. It uh, shows up in your history too. Yeah. yeah that's great. Uh, it can be, yeah, it can be stored. I mean, if you're using the browser uh, to store your password, right? It's stored in a file on your computer, which means if anybody has access to your computer, they have access to all those uh, passwords. Uh, they can also be easy to lose, right? And it's very difficult. We talked about this, no control on sharing, right? If you share your password with somebody, there's no guarantee that they won't share it with somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. Um, also very uh, susceptible to social engineering and specifically phishing. So one of the classic social engineering uh, attacks would be uh, you call up somebody who works at a company, say, hey, this is Adam in IT, I hear you're having problems with your computer, and they say, yes, finally, thank you for calling me. Uh, and you say, great, well, just to, for me to verify your identity, so you are who you say you are, um, please tell me you're using a password so before we proceed for your security. They say, yeah, great, I'm, you know, whoever, Alice, you're my password, password. And you go, great, you walk them through some stuff, and now you've sold them. Or in uh, more of the phishing context, I trick you to click on a link that takes you to a page that it looks exactly like Gradescope. It's an email that says, hey, you failed your latest assignment turn in. And you go, what? Like, I just got 100%. I know it. You click on it. It says you got to log in. It looks exactly like Gradescope. You type in your username and password. And unfortunately, that is a site that's actually controlled by an attacker. And they just collected your username and password and transparently redirect you back to Gradescope so you never notice that anything was different. Um, this is actually one of the big things we 
try to look at and solve in our research of studying uh, phishing um, for big brands like PayPal and Google and these types of things. Uh, there's also a lot of practical vulnerabilities. So like we said, visible, like your password has to be transmitted. And so it's visible over insecure uh, distributed network systems, susceptible to replay attacks where if somebody gets your password right, they can log in as you. And password reuse is a huge problem. And it actually puts a ton of burden and effort onto users, right? Because now the users have to deal with this burden of not of remembering passwords, but choosing unique passwords, but choosing a unique password per site. Uh, that is all of this insane complexity. And it's easy to screw up, as we saw. So companies can store passwords in plain text, which just increases the severity of the problem. Um, cool. And so we've talked about these. So what, so, some types of attacks would be like a dictionary attack. Um, just try each word in the dictionary or a word file. Compute the hash. Check that the hash equals the complementary information. And it's super easy to search all likely passwords, right? Because we can even, and we'll get to them later, we'll look at data dumps and we can see what passwords are most, are commonly used by people. Um, yeah, so we can have different types of attacks. So this goes with the different uh, styles of authentication. We can have an offline attack where we know the function and we know the complementary information. We've stolen the hash. We can repeatedly try different things. There are tools for this. Uh, the other type of dictionary attack is an online attack where we're attacking the login function itself. So we have access to L and we just keep trying guesses until it succeeds. Um, cool. Okay. And when we get back on Thursday, we'll uh, continue with how to stop this.